and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Hello and welcome to the last in the series. I'll be back with a new series very shortly. Coming up in this episode, we get all the latest Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games from July 1985. And in an end of series special, I'll be taking a look at one of the most well-known companies to produce games for the Spectrum, the legendary Ultimate Play the Game. But first, the news. Challenge Research has announced a new version of its turbo-loading cassette recorder, named the Sprint Mark II. This normal-sized tape recorder will allow games to be loaded and saved at four times the normal rate, and the unit will cost £69.95p. Silversoft, the veteran software house, has entered into an agreement with CRL that will provide better marketing and sales. CRL will take shares in the company and it is hoped the new Silversoft games will benefit from this new partnership. In a bid to produce accurate and reliable figures for faulty hardware, Sinclair and other companies are going to participate in a new monitoring experiment. At the moment it is difficult for buyers to get accurate data about the return rate of particular computers reading figures in various magazines that are often inflated and trying to see through the figures quoted by the companies, obviously trying to play down any issues. Some magazines claim that over 30% of Spectrums are returned, while Sinclair state that it is much lower, around 12%. The new scheme will see a two-part card slipped into every Spectrum box. Upon finding a fault, one half is sent to Sinclair to initiate the repair and the other half is sent to the trade newspaper so that figures can be more accurately recorded. With the recent change in the copyright bill, it is now illegal to pirate commercial games, and software houses are hoping that this will stop the thieves from ripping the public off and taking their profits. The MP, William Powell, who initiated this bill, states that the pirates must now stop, because what they're doing is illegal. Copying games at home, so say many software houses, is killing the business, with lost revenue causing the companies to become bankrupt. With the shock announcement last month of the proposed takeover by Robert Maxwell of Sinclair Research, there have been a few knock-on effects. Timex have reduced their manufacturing capacity, meaning the loss of 400 jobs. Sir Clive's role has been confirmed and he will head up a new company called Sir Clive Sinclair Limited that will offer services to Sinclair Research. Hoover, the company that manufactured the C5 electric car, also claim they're about to serve a writ on Sinclair vehicles for non-payment. The writ will be for around £1.5 million of unpaid debt. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. New into the charts this month are Nodes of Yesod, a nice looking arcade adventure from Odin. Jet Set Willy 2, more minor Willy antics from software projects. Cauldron, an arcade adventure from Palace Software. Rocco, the boxing game from Gremlin Graphics. And Hypersports, the Konami conversion from Imagine Software. the news and top selling Spectrum games from July 1985. It all began with a small company producing arcade games. In 1982 in the village of Aspie de la Zouche, two brothers were working in the arcade game field producing games for the growing industry that dominated the seafronts of many UK resorts. Between them, Tim and Chris Stamper, along with their friend John Lathbury, produced four arcade games that sold to US and Japanese markets. The first, released in 1982 by Bally Midway, was called Blueprint and featured a man trying to collect parts for his machine. Thank you. 
The next three were all released in 1983. Saturn was released by Jellico and was a shoot 'em up. Again for Jellico was a kind of maze game with spinning wall sections. And finally Dingo, again for Jellico, a game they managed to at least get their company name in. ACG, which stood for Ashby Computers and Graphics, a name that appears throughout their gaming careers. By 1983, the home computer market was starting to pick up, and that, coupled with the ever more expensive arcade design tools, forced the young company to look for something more economical. Initially not too impressed with Clive Sinclair's new micro, the ZX Spectrum, saying in an interview that they thought it was a piece of garbage. The market though was too good to ignore, especially as the machine used the Z80 processor, used in many early arcade machines, including the ones produced by Tim and Chris. Creating a new company that would become synonymous with quality, the Stampers embarked on an all-out attack on the software industry. They knew they were good, probably better than the current crop in 1983, and they also had the added knowledge of game design from their arcade days. With this, they decided on a name that would emphasise their confidence, and Ultimate Play the Game were born. They wanted their games to be the ultimate games, and bringing Carol Ward in to help, the four strong company set about proving themselves. With the Spectrum only having 16k of memory, programming had to be tight, and the games had to be as close to arcade quality as possible. And they were. Jetpack hit the shelves in mid-1983, and sent shockwaves through the industry. A game of this quality, with large smooth graphics, good sound and superb playability, made everything that had gone before look ordinary. The industry had been given a wake-up call, and now were playing catch-up. Controlling your Jetman, you had to collect parts of your rocket and then refuel it before moving on. Hordes of aliens were set on your demise, and there were four ships to build, each having four levels to play. Something unheard of in a 16k game. The game got great reviews in the press, and Ultimate had arrived in a big way. Wanting to keep the pressure on, Ultimate quickly followed this game with Psst. Controlling a gardening robot, who would later make an appearance in a future game, you had to help the flower grow by squirting garden pests with the correct spray. Again, the game had large, beautifully drawn graphics that were smooth and well animated. The sound and playability were excellent, and this, like Jetpack, sold in thousands. Jetpack sold over 300,000 copies, helping to keep this young company going and produced more games. Their games were written using an expensive development system that allowed code to be uploaded straight into the micro. This meant rapid development and their initial aim of producing one game every two months seemed optimistic, even for them. Within a few months though, two more games hit the market. Cookie, where you control the chef who had to round up the ingredients to bake a pie. This game had a nice intro sequence too, very reminiscent of Pac-Man, and some nicely drawn nasties to avoid.
final game was Trans Am, for me the weaker of the releases, where you drove a car around a large play area collecting 8 cups, refuelling a lot and trying to survive. These four games were also transferred to Sinclair's new ROM format, which was limited to 16K and ideally suited to these games. They outshone the other six releases and are highly sought on eBay and still a great play. As Ultimate's games grew in complexity, they made the move to 48K, giving them more room to flex their game design muscles. First came the follow-up to Jetpack, Lunar Jetman, in late 1984. This expanded the world, giving a scrolling landscape and lunar buggy to drive. The gameplay was also changed to a more involved game where you had to destroy an alien base by using a bomb. The buggy was used as a refueling point too, and as transport for the bomb. You also had to build small bridges if there were craters on the surface. All in all, a much more complex affair. There was a rumour that the game featured a trailer too, and an image appeared in Crash Magazine, allegedly proving the point. Sadly, it was all a hoax, as Ultimate confirmed later in an interview, and scouring the source code found no graphics that matched the screenshot. Some say the stampers sent it to the magazine to gain publicity, but I guess we'll never know. The next game just made it before the end of the year, and it was Ultimate's fifth, Attic Attack. Getting rave reviews in all the magazines, this game again changed the way developers and game companies looked at the Spectrum. It was something different and offered much deeper gameplay than the average release. You could play one of four character types, and which one you chose gave you access to different secret tunnels around the castle. The aim was to escape and to do that you had to find parts of the ACG key, a cheeky plug at their original name. The game was a top-down maze game, with different areas to explore, different monsters to defeat with different objects, and coloured door keys needed to access more rooms. There were also trapdoors that sent you plummeting down levels, staircases, and a rather well-drawn chicken that displayed your health status. Another genre-defining moment for Ultimate Play the Game. By now the company were gaining a very large following helped by the mystery that surrounded not only the company, but the games too. They very rarely gave interviews, especially during this busy period. The only ones that spring to mind are one in Home Computer Weekly from August 1983, the well-known one in Crash from April 1988, and of course the one in The Games Machine in March 1988. Were they trying to be aloof? Who knows? But working 16 hours a day, 7 days a week, meant that they just didn't have time but it did build up a certain mystique, and in reality they preferred instead to work on new games that were only promoted, in the days after the 16K games, by single page adverts. There was no hype, no quotes saying something like this has never been seen before, no previews, no trade shows, just these wonderfully drawn images. This made the buying public eager to get their hands on them and sales were booming. As 1984 arrived, Ultimate made the decision to move to larger boxes, and this of course raised the price. Their normal tape games retailed at £5.50, but these newer games would now cost £9.95. Ultimate stated that it was done for two reasons, firstly to reflect the amount of time put into the games, and secondly to try and combat piracy. They thought, having paid nearly £10 for a game, you were less likely to allow your friend to copy it. A bold move that was sneered at by some members of the press, but the game still sold well and regularly hit the number one spot. Their first game released in 1984 was Saber Wolf, a top-down mace style game, a game with added depth of having to fight enemies with your sword, protect yourself by eating a variety of plants, and trying to locate the four pieces of an amulet. This game introduced a new character, Saberman, who would later go on to more games, and have cameos in a lot of other games done by the company later on, like Banjo Tooie, Donkey Kong Country, and Goldeneye. The game was a top seller, selling over 350,000 copies and enjoying a long period in the charts. It also spawned a mass of map making, with magazines running competitions for the best map. Following this came the further adventures of Saberman in Underworld. 
this side-on platform game didn't break any new ground, apart from having a massive 597 locations. There were three exits, each having a guardian to defeat, and each guardian requiring a different weapon. Each exit would take Saber Man to one of three sequels of the game, Nightlaw, Pentagram and Myrmare. It was obvious that if these games were actually named, that they must be under development, which got fans in a frenzy waiting to see what Ultimate would do next. The truth was that at least one of them was finished before Saber Wolf, but more on that later. As Underworld hit the shelves, news of something very special was beginning to hit the magazines. A new style of game, taking gameplay to another level. Normally when companies made these claims, they were politely ignored, but this time it was Ultimate. As 1984 was coming to an end, the game that created a whole new genre and that made everyone stare at their spectrums in disbelief was released. Nightlaw used a new technique, labelled Filmation by Ultimate, to display the game world in an isometric fashion. The result was stunning. This type of look and graphic detail had never been seen before. Games like Ant Attack had come close, but this was something very special. The game saw Saberman searching for items to put into a wizard's cauldron that would cure him. Oh yes, didn't I mention? He'd been cursed and at midnight he turns into a werewolf. Each room has a different set of blocks, some requiring careful jumping, others requiring manipulation of objects to be able to get to the exits. This game stormed the charts and players everywhere were again praising the innovation that Ultimate were bringing to the Spectrum. Ultimate won the game of the year with it, in 1985, from Computer and Video Game magazine. What people didn't know until much later though, was that remarkably this game was finished before Saber Wolf. Not only that, but Alien 8 was also well into development. But, being in tune with the market, the Stampers knew that Saberwolf's sales would be affected if they put Nightlaw out at the same time, or before it. Because of that, they sat on this game, biding their time until it was right to release. That must have taken some guts. The game spawned a whole avalanche of copies, and the genre was well and truly established. The next game saw the return of Robbie the Robot from Psst, in Ultimate's first game for 1985. Alien 8. This time he was given the isometric treatment as well. He'd come a long way from his garden and is now in charge of fixing the cryogenic units of a spaceship that was damaged during an attack. The gameplay is very similar to Nightlaw, triggering some complaints from the press and game players that the game was just Nightlaw with different graphics. This though wasn't true, and the game sold very well. The controls were the same, making this game easy to get into, and the task was simple. Collect all the objects, of which there are 24, and place them in the correct sockets to keep the cryogenic units functioning. This game, for me at least, relied more on jumping precision than its predecessor, and some of them were very tricky, requiring direction changes at crucial points. Coming next was Nightshade. Using an upgraded version of Filmation, called Filmation 2, the game sees you playing a knight on a quest to rid the village of four demons. As with previous Ultimate games, each demon required a specific weapon to destroy it. The village is populated by plague-ridden people that can pass on their disease to the knight if you bump into them. To reverse the effect, the knight can use antibodies, which also double as throwable weapons. The game engine moves away from the flip screen, used in Nightlaw and Alien 8, onto scrolling, which is a nice improvement, although the actual screen area is reduced somewhat. For some fans it seemed that Ultimate were losing the interest in the market, and their next release did not break any new ground or introduce anything new to the spectrum. The games market seemed to hold less interest with the stampers, 
and their attention now was firmly on the blossoming Japanese console market. In the background they had been working on this for quite a while, since 1984 in fact, trying to reverse engineer the Nintendo Entertainment System so that they could start to write games for it. To allow them to move on they had to part with the company name, and so it was sold along with Ultimate's back catalogue to US Gold in 1985, bringing to an end a great and innovative time for Spectrum development. They still had a few games in development that US Gold distributed under the Ultimate name, and the next one was Gunfright, released in 1986. This swapped the knight from Nightshade into a sheriff out to rid the town of outlaws. Using the Filmation 2 engine, the only main difference between this and the earlier games is the shooting section in which our hero has to duel with the outlaws. He also has some money that is reduced if the outlaw shoots someone and is refilled if the outlaw is disposed of. There are 20 different outlaws to track down, one at a time, each becoming faster on the draw and therefore more difficult to kill. The stampers claim that this was the last title developed by the proper Ultimate team. Moving away from 3D, finally, and Ultimate released a strange game, Cyber Run. This game though was not written by the stampers, and some say it is not therefore a real Ultimate game. You have to search the planet, locate parts of a spaceship, Build your ship and then use it to mine ore. The gameplay is similar to Thrust, but with more enemies to shoot, and is really a mix of Jetpack and Lunar Jetman. Next, also in 1986, comes Pentagram. Remember this? This is one of the three sequels to Underworld, and sees Saberman returning for another adventure. In this game he has to locate the Pentagram, but obviously it's a little more complex than that. The quest involves locating walls, collecting buckets of water and healing rocks. Gameplay is very similar to both Nightlaw and Alien 8, and uses the same game engine. Added to this version though are projectiles, so you can actually shoot enemies. Again we see movable blocks that help the puzzles. This was the last of what might have been considered as real Ultimate games, but Ocean, using other development teams, continued to release under the Ultimate name. There was Martianoids, another Filmation type game. In this somewhat more playable game than Pentagram, you control a robot that has to guide a program to the correct location within the brain of your spaceship. You also have to keep your batteries charged and destroy the invading aliens. The scrolling is nice and the graphics are large and well drawn but it lacks something special. And Bubbler, a Marble Madden style game where you had to go around putting corks into holes. The game looks like Marble Madness, but plays in a totally different and somewhat terrible way. The control system is bad, very bad. The rotate and move control should not be used on a game like this. It's just awful to control or get anywhere. You spend too much time looking at the compass to see which direction you're heading.
and the game suffers from that instant death syndrome, in that if you get close to a tower that fires at you and die, you respawn in the same place and usually get shot straight away. A totally frustrating game. Ultimate Play the game had moved on by now and changed their name to Rare and enjoyed a long and fruitful career as console developers, being responsible for such greats as Donkey Kong Country, Killer Instinct, GoldenEye, The Conquers Games and of course the Banjo Games. As an 8-bit company they were revered, averaging a 93% score in Crash Magazine, making them the most successful Spectrum publishing house ever. But their story doesn't end, as there are still a few mysteries left. First we have the rumour of a third Jetman game, named Solar Jetman. This game never appeared on the Spectrum, but was released for the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES as it's known. It was thought that this game existed for the Spectrum, deep in the vaults of Rare, but nothing has ever been found. Screenshots of the game did appear in Crash Magazine, fueling the debate of a playable demo, but again nothing has ever come to light. And what of Myrmare, the third sequel to Underworld, mentioned all the way back in this feature? This is the most intriguing mystery. Someone claiming to be an ex-employee of Ultimate says he actually played the game, but of course this can be never verified. The Stampers denied it was anywhere near ready at the time they were bought out by US Gold, maybe to put US Gold off, as the Stampers were said not to be happy with the way their old games were being put out on budget labels. Artwork for the game also surfaced, but what of the game itself? The Stampers maintain the game was only ever in the design stages. I suppose we'll never know the truth. Hang on though. This is Land of Myrmer, created using Jonathan Caldwell's arcade game designer and written by Luca Bordoni in 2014. This is a tribute game based around the rumours that have been previously mentioned earlier in the episode. The story goes that three volcanoes are about to destroy the territory, and the only way to stop this disaster is to find three gems and drop them into a well. Anyone who has played the Ultimate games will instantly recognise the graphic style, brilliantly recreated by Binman, and partly based on the screen mock-ups that in turn were based on rumours about how Myrmir could have looked. You guide Saberman on his quest, trying to locate the gems and trying to avoid various monsters along the way. Luckily, he can pick up and use his sword, that can be used to kill most of them. Unlike the Ultimate games, however, when using his weapon, there is no animation to accompany it, but this is only a small point and doesn't distract from the game. Pressing fire when Saberman has his sword will cause the sword icon to flash, accompanied by a sound effect, and, if Saberman collides with a destructible monster, it will be killed. There are various doors that require keys, and these can be found and used only once. Or, he can pick up an axe and break them down. Although, carrying an axe means that he has to drop his sword. Each of the gems have a guardian that cannot be destroyed so quick footwork will hopefully get you the item. Gems also cannot be collected unless you have something to drop in their place, so you have to keep an eye out for things that are lying around. Once you have a gem, it's off to the well to drop it in. Scattered around the game map are extra lives and bottles of water, that can replenish his strength, 
which is reduced when he collides with the monsters. This game does look like an ultimate game, which is testament to Binman's great work. And although there are limitations imposed by using arcade game designer, I think the author has done an excellent job of recreating those golden days of ultimate play the game. A good job all round then, and well worth playing, especially if you enjoyed games like Sabre Wolf or Wizard's Lair. Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon! <laughs>